Namaste and good evening, everyone. I am Ritika Gupta, Assistant Director at IMFRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, Pravav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sanstan, Nai Dilli. Warmly welcome you to IMFRI Hashtag Web Policy Talk. We are here for a special lecture, Hashtag Employment Debate on how to enable Indian SMEs to penetrate the global value chains of transnational corporations, the need to strengthen regional innovation systems by Professor M. H. Pala Subramanian. I would now like to welcome our moderator for today, Dr. Simi Mehta, who is CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI. Ma'am, over to you. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you, Ritika, for leading us into the discussion. Uh, as you have rightly mentioned, that uh, to delve into how to enable Indian SMEs to penetrate the global value chains of TNCs, the need to strengthen regional innovation systems we have with us, Professor M. H. Bala Subramania, uh, uh, joining us this evening. Uh, it is my delight and privilege to introduce uh, Professor M. H. Bala Subramania to you. Uh, he is Professor of Economics at the Department of Management Studies, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. His field of specialization is industrial economics. He holds a PhD in economics from Institute for Social and Economic Change, ISEC, Bangalore. He has been serving the IISC, uh, Bangalore, since May 1996. During his illustrious professional career, he has received Commonwealth Fellowship, Japan Foundation Fellowship, and Fulbright Nehru Senior Fellowship, Senior Research Fellowship. He has worked as a visiting research fellow at the University of Durham, United Kingdom, National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, Tokyo in Japan, and at University of California, Davis, United States. Professor Subramanya has more than 100 publications to his credit comprised of research papers in refereed national and international journals, international conferences, books, and monographs. Some of the reputed journals in which he has published his research papers are Economic and Political Weekly, Energy Conversion and Management, Energy Policy, International Journal of Innovation Management, among others. He's also on the editorial board of 10 journals, including Current Science in Bang from Bangalore, Asian Journal of Innovation and Policy, South Korea, and International Journal of Entrepreneurial Behavior and Research, United Kingdom, amongst others. Professor Subramanya has executed 14 research, sponsored research and consultancy projects and guided 13 students for the PhD degrees at IISC. And he has, he's still guiding eight more students for their PhDs. Uh, two of his recent research works have been published as monographs by De Gruyter, Germany, uh, Berlin, in uh, January 2021, namely Entrepreneurial Ecosystems for Tech Startups in India, Evolution, Structure and Role, and Technology Business Incubators in India, Structure, Role and Performance. His co-author is Dr. H.S. Krishna. Welcome, sir. I now you. invite you to to, con to begin pleasure. with your presentation. Thank yeah. you, sir. And, and uh, we also have our discussants, uh, uh, Mr. Ketan Reddy, from um, whom I'll be introducing subsequently, and also uh, Dr. Radhika Pandey. Welcome, both of you. Yes, sir, please begin with your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, so we have uh, Professor Dev Nathan here. Well, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so, uh, sir, if you would just permit me, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Dev Nathan to you. I'm delighted on behalf of all of us. I take this opportunity to introduce to you Professor Dev Nathan. He studied economics at the University of Bombay. He is professor at the Institute of Human Development, New Delhi, and also a vis visiting research scholar at Duke University, USA. His previous consultancies have been with Asian Development Bank, World Bank, UNDP, World Food Program, Dutch Development Corporation, and several others. Currently, he is the coordinator of the IDRC-supported South Asia Research Network on Employment and Social Protection. Recently, he coordinated the multi-country research project titled Capturing the Gains, Economic and Social Upgrading in Global Production. 
His research interests include labor in global production, gender relations, and development issues of indigenous peoples. Some of his recent co-authored and co-edited books include Markets and Indigenous Peoples in Asia, published by Oxford University Press, Labor in Global Value Chains in Asia, published by Cambridge University Press, among others. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and chairing the session. So with your permission, um, sir, would you like to provide an opening remarks and then thereafter invite Professor Bala Subramaniam to deliver his lecture? Okay, thank you, Simi. Thanks. Yes, thank you, sir. I'm happy to chair, to be the chairperson of this uh, webinar, which will be, will have a main lecture by Dr. Subramanya. As Simi has already introduced him to you, I would not repeat that. But the topic is, of course, of very interest to me and to, I presume, a lot of us. That is, how will how to enable Indian SMEs to penetrate the global value chains of transnational uh, corporations. Now, as we know, a lot of trade is nowadays organized in the form of global value chains. What that means, I'm sure Dr. Bala Subramanian will tell us something about that. But it's important, therefore, to know how one can be part of and also how to upgrade within the global value chains. This is a very critical issue for developing countries as they move from being LDCs to become MDCs or from uh, low income countries to middle and further to high in, to, uh, along the further moving along the middle income trajectory also. So with these few remarks, I will request Dr. Bala Subrabhanya to please make his presentation. Thank you, sir. Good evening to all of you. At the outset, I would like to express my deep sense of gratitude to Impri and Dr. Arjun Kumar uh, for inviting me to deliver this web talk. It's an opportunity for me to share my thoughts on particularly on small and medium enterprises in the Indian context with reference to global value chains. Now, um, as we all know, uh, can I share the uh, PPT? Uh, Dr. Simi? Yes, please, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, where is it? Just a minute. Is that? Oh, is it? Uh, is no, 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 no. You, not yet? Did you, did you share, click the share screen? One button. minute, one minute. Yes, sir. No. I think there is some problem. Um, we can do it if you would. No, better if I do it because I can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's start. It started now. Started? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can instruct us when to change the slide. We will change. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so I welcome all the participants apart from the discussants and the organizers of this event. Now, at the outset, I would like to bring to the kind attention of one and all that we all know that small and medium enterprises account for a major share of the total number of enterprises and they occupy a place of strategic importance in almost every economy on the global space. That is because of the immense contribution to national economies. Contributions have multiple uh, facets, but I would say four of them stand up. One, employment, obviously. Two, innovation, innovation of various kinds. Uh, three, income, and four, exports. Now, this would hold good for almost every economy where SMEs exist and operate. Well, among the national economies, I would say India occupies a unique position because India has a long-standing policy for the protection and promotion of small and medium enterprises for a pretty long time. And the objective is to, uh, rather, this promotion, protection promotion has multiple objectives. Now, of them, the foremost is employment generation. Now, this is because how to generate employment to the large and growing labor force has been a challenge persistently faced by our policy makers. And SMEs have been adopted as one of the, if not the policy instrument, 
to overcome this challenge ever since India attained its independence in 1957. Now, one thing we need, need to note that both policies and challenges faced by the assemblies, they have undergone dramatic changes over a period of time. But along with these dramatic changes in policies, as well as challenges, the SME sector, formerly it was known as small and small scale industry sector, now it is known as SME sector. SME sector has grown uh, in size uh, as well as in terms of contributions substantially you know, to the national economy over a period of time. But that does not mean that we have completely exploited the potential of the sector to contribute to our economy. In fact, I'm of the view that sub, if we are able to promote and develop the sector more, more appropriately, we'll be able to generate more contribution from this sector. But if we have to adequately exploit the potential of the SME sector on, a, on an increasing scale in the future, we need to target the international market on a much larger scale than what is being done currently. Now, it is in this context that my presentation assumes significance. Next slide. So, but as far as international trade is concerned, uh, we all know that it is increasingly dominated by the global value chains of transnational corporations. Now, there are various estimates, but uh, I would like to make reference to two of the authors. Now, their argument is GVCs account for anywhere between two-thirds to four-fifths of the global trade. Now, obviously, or needless to, stay, needless to say, predominantly, these TNCs belong to the developed world. But newly industrialized economies and emerging economies like China, Malaysia, Thailand, and even Indonesia and Vietnam, they all have joined the global value chains of transnational corporations pretty well. And thereby, they are reaping benefits out of it in the form of achieving dramatic advances in living standards and economic growth. Now, these developments have implications implications in the form of challenges as well as opportunities to Indian economy, particularly its small and medium enterprises. Now, recently, we have been seeing that a new dimension is emerging. The, this new dimension is due to the all-pervading COVID-19 and the consequences uh, that it is leading to. Now, this in turn has given, uh, given uh, new, uh, rather in turn has three important dimensions. One, it has severely disrupted the global value chains of TNCs globally. Two, it has adversely affected demand as well as supply of Indian SMEs in the national and regional markets. Three, it is prompting GVC-led investments of TNCs to go for a relocation to countries like India. Some have happened, uh, some have already shifted their base to countries like India, some are in the process. Now, it is with this backdrop that I would like to focus your attention on small and medium enterprises in India. Hereafter, I will make reference to them as SMEs. Now, SMEs in India, it's a fairly diversified sector. They produce as many as 6,000 products and they comprise enterprises of, with varying technological strengths most outdated to most outdated to most sophisticated. And more, more importantly, they account for a substantial share of India's exports. That is why I, I tend to argue that they are at the forefront of India's internationalization. In fact, they accounted for almost one half of the total exports as per the statistics with respect to 2018-19. But the paradox is that one, hardly 1% 1 of the total 63 plus million Indian SMEs has entered the international market as of now. Now, this leads to two questions. Question number one, why have Indian SMEs not been able to seize the opportunities from the ever-growing global value chains of transnational corporations? Two, if we are not able to, how to enable more and more Indian SMEs to access and exploit the GVCs of TNCs? Now, before going ahead, 
I would like to make reference to the GBCs of TNCs described. This is a typical GBC of a TNC as described by various authors. This is not my creation. I have made reference to various authors. As you would see here, the value chain of a global company it would have got spread all across the globe. It, could, it may be vertically integrated, it may be horizontally integrated activities. They are spread all over the world. It could be RN, R&D affiliates may be located in other countries. Design affiliates may be in other countries. Production affiliates may be in multiple countries. Marketing and distribution may happen all over the globe. Now services may happen, software services may, may emerge from countries like India. And then the question is, why is it global value chain has emerged as a strategy? Now, the rationale behind the growth of global value chains is TNCs. They have actually promoted the overall rationale behind the adoption of these global value chains is through complex integration strategy. Now, let me uh, clarify, complex integration strategy is different from simple integration strategy and standalone strategy of TNCs we emer which emerged in the, particularly in the 70s and 80s, mainly because of their resource seeking objective and, and uh, market seeking objective. Now the objective of adoption of complex in in integration strategy is simple. It is mainly to enhance their efficiency to make more profits and more profits through cost reduction. Now, as per this uh, complex integration strategy, a TNC may look at any part of its value chain anywhere in the, in, the global, in the global economy. The only objective is to reduce costs, become more efficient, make more profits. Now, it is with that objective that the production processes of transnational corporations have been broken up and, and that enables them to locate any part of the value chain anywhere. But this breaking up of the production process processes of TNCs, it actually offers opportunities for integration of enterprises from both developed and developing economies, which in turn enables integration of both these two broad economic groups. Now, that would, are the arguably, that would actually derive benefits for both. Now, it is debatable, but let us come to that later. Now, another significant feature of GBCs is that each part of it would indulge in trade with local firms in the domestic market or in the regional markets as and when necessary and as and when it is advantageous for the TNCs. Now, it is this particular development which actually gives a scope for local firms to participate or to get integrated with the GBCs of TNCs. Now, but it is important to note that entering into the global value chains of TNCs is not a cakewalk. And in fact, studies have repeatedly brought out that those regional or local or national firms, which are part of these GBCs, they tend to display high levels of innovation, efficiency, and productivity. Now, this indicates two things. One, unless and until a national or a local firm is competitive, in terms of if high level of efficiency, high level of innovation, and high level of productivity, it is unlikely to get into the GVC. But in case it succeeds into the GVC of TNCs, it will have opportunities to further enhance its innovation, further enhance its efficiency and productivity, and gain for its subsequent growth. And that is precisely why the European Parliament has noted that participation in global or regional value chains can be beneficial in fostering a firm's growth and internationalization, irrespective of its scale and size. Now, this has particular relevance to SMEs because SMEs always lack, uh, or uh, to, to a large extent, they lack internal resources. That's why they always look for complementing their internal strength with external resources to develop further. And if SMEs are able to penetrate or link themselves with the GBCs, then SMEs, now it would help them to learn through spillovers and knowledge transfers and in turn, now enable them to improve their performance through product innovations and also by gaining more market knowledge. 
In fact, internationalization provides the right conditions for SMEs to enhance productivity, while also enabling the spillover of technological and managerial know-how and facilitate accelerate innovation. Now, as far as SMEs are concerned, developed country SMEs are in a better position in the global economy today because they are better integrated with the GVCs of TNCs. That is reflected in, in one in terms of the share that they have in the value of exports. Of course, it would look smaller in terms of percentage, less than that of India, but we, we need to note here that the export cake of developed countries is much bigger, and in that more than one third is accounted by the SMEs. And more importantly, uh, we need to note that as more than three fourths of the total number of SMEs in the developed world is linked to the international market, and that in turn actually would lead them to the GVCs. But, but another issue that need to be noted here is not all SMEs will be able to take advantage of the opportunities that would be emerging from the rapidly expanding GVCs through linkages. That is because SMEs in general, both in the developed world and in the developing world, they are known for their internal constraints or internal barriers. Now, this due to their smaller scale and lower levels of sophistication or less sophistication. And also they are prone to market failures, leading to limited access to finance, and SMEs often face greater difficulties in internationalizing their activities than their counterparts. Now, this holds good for developing country SMEs much more than developed country SMEs. And that is why it is often argued that they have low, lower levels of integration in GVCs. Now, according to the one World Bank statistics, exports, SMEs in developing countries, now they account for hardly 8% of the manufacturing sales. And within the SME sector of the developing countries, SMEs with fewer employees, they take a longer time to access the international markets than the larger firms. Now further, but the other important thing is, even if they succeed, the kind of, even if the developing country SMEs, they succeed in penetrating and integrating into the GVCs of TNCs, the kind of benefits that they would be able to derive out of it would depend upon the entry point and the position in the global production networks and the links that they could develop within those networks subsequently. Now, all these have implications for Indian economy, particularly its SMEs. Because if an emerging economy like India, if, if they have to make a mark on the global production network, similar to say China and other emerging economies, it is absolutely necessary to enable domestic forms, you mean SMEs, to penetrate and link with the GVCs on an increasing scale. Now, as I have already said, SMEs are at the forefront of India's internationalization, though in a limited way, in terms of number of enterprises which have entered the international market. Now, it is essential to examine and explore the promotion of SME internationalization, leading to GVC linkages steadily and consistently. This assumes a significance because Ministry of MSMEs in the strategy action plan unveiled for MSMEs in 2018 has already declared it as one of the objectives. Now, having said that, let us briefly look at the statistics uh, in terms of the SME structure in India. The upper portion of the table indicates statistics for various variables, whereas the lower portion indicates their you know, structure, subsectoral structure and employment per enterprise. Enterpr uh, SMEs today is sizable because they account for, they have almost rather more than 63 million enterprises of varying sizes, and they employ more than 111 million persons uh, that would account for anywhere between 25 to say, more than 25% of the total workforce of the country. And yeah, uh, so they would, the SMEs are second only to agriculture, as well as employment generation is concerned. So that is the kind of significance they have in Indian economy. And the industri industrial production share is again nearly one half, uh, and the GDP share is nearly one third, and ex share in exports is nearly one half. But if you look at the subsectoral structure in terms of micro enterprises, small enterprises, and medium enterprises, 
uh, predominantly they are dom they are accounted by micro enterprises where the employment share is 1.71 percent per enterprise whereas it is much bigger or much more in the case of small scale enterprises it's almost 10 and medium scale enterprises it is 35 percent so what is clear from these statistics is they belong to different years that's why i have not mentioned any specific year but they belong to the recent period now, a substantial chunk of Indian SMEs is suboptimal by, by scale. Now, if that is true, let us forget about the micro enterprises because they are mostly single employer come employee enterprises, which will not give scope for any kind of internationalization. There could be exceptions, but by and large, they will, they will not have the scope to, uh, store, scope to enter the international market in a big way. So let us look at small and medium enterprises, small scale enterprises and medium scale enterprises. Are they integrated well with the, with the international market? The answer is no. Now the answer is no, because we have already found out that the number of exporting SMEs is negligibly low in the uh, in, in Indian economy. Uh, uh, and if then the question is why? Now let me reason out. Now first, if SMEs have to internationalize and integrate themselves with the GVCs on a considerable scale, they have to be competitive. They have to be efficient. They have to be productive. Now, which require them to be innovative because one of the principal determinants of SME's competitiveness is innovation as brought up by Pachauri and Shankar. But are, are our SMEs innovative? Well, innovation, particularly radical innovation is largely absent in the Indian context. Now, this is reflected very clearly by a nationwide study conducted by Nath and others from NISTATS, uh, NISTATS Delhi. Now they have brought out that radical nation would account for very negligible percentage of SMEs. In other words, this is, this is nothing, uh, this is just one study. Uh, prior to this, National Knowledge Commission has uh, carried out a study in 2007. Again, it had brought out that only a minority of the SMEs in India is radically innovative. Even I have conducted some studies in the context of Karnataka, uh, where we found out that innovation, particularly radical innovation is largely absent. And if at all, it is there, it is confined to SMEs in Bangalore. So this substantiates that radical innovation is largely absent in Indian SMEs. Now, why radical innovation is largely absent in Indian SMEs is, is the question that we need to answer. Now, that is because innovation does not occur in silos. And we need to understand that a substantial chunk of Indian SMEs, they exist and operate in silos. And SMEs operating in silos are unlikely to innovate. That is because, uh, as I have repeatedly said, SMEs, they have internal constraints. Now, if innovation among SMEs has to thrive, they need to be networked. They need to be networked in the local or regional markets. That is because innovation emerges only when there is close interaction between a firm that wants to pursue innovation and the support system that assists the firm in securing the required resources for innovation. And good number of studies have brought out that there's a positive correlation between networking and innovation or interlinkages and innovation. Now this network can emerge in various forms. Either it can emerge in the form of vertical linkages with customers and suppliers or horizontal linkages with academic or research institutes, government agencies, industry associations, or SMEs of the same industry or in the same cluster. Now, now do we, we do not have readily available statistics to throw light on the status of networks of SMEs existing in the country. But I could uh, make, uh, but I would like to make reference to the interform networking, the form of ancillarization of SMEs available from the MSME statistic, it, statistics. It was a meager 0.52% in 87, 88, as revealed by the, uh, I think by the first, uh, first census or second, first census, maybe. yeah, or second census. And, but it improved by almost 10 times to reach 5.08 by 2001 to uh, in the registered SME sector, that is the third census. Yes, the, the previous one was first, uh, second census, I guess. So this is the third census. Thereafter, unfortunately, the fourth census did not reveal 
any 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 statistics relating to subcontracting and ancillarization. In a country like Japan, mere industrial subcontracting itself accounted for more than 50% of the total number of SMEs. So that is the kind of interform relationship they have. But networking is much beyond interform networking. It is not merely large, small relationship. It is, as I said, it could be even horizontal collaborations with industry, with, with uh, research institutes, with academic uh, engineering institutions, with R&D institutes, it could be with other, other SMEs. So in fact, lack of, but, but NKC study, that is National Knowledge Commission in the study carried out in 2007 has brought out that if radical innovation is largely absent because lack of collaboration with other firms in the same industry and with universities and R&D labs, that was the major reason for it, uh, which was identified as one of the external barriers for SME innovation. Now, having said that, so let me summarize at this stage. Indian, uh, Indian SMEs have a very limited presence in the GVCs of TNCs due to their weak internationalization, which in turn is due to their weak innovation base, owing to their weak networks, particularly due to weak interform linkages. Now, this in turn could be attributed to weak internal strength, and many of them are operating in silos, and or and or or no weak external or no external support available locally or regionally. This brings out that to exploit a semi sector's potential and transform them, efforts must be made to strengthen them locally to enable their penetration and reach globally. Now, this is the uh, rather, rather in the form of a figure I have presented. Limited presence in the GVCs of TNCs due to weak internationalization, weak innovation base, weak network, including weak interform linkages, because Indian SMEs, they have, they have weak internal strength and they have weak external support. Then how to change the scenario is the, is the question that we need to answer. Now, the ability and potential of SMEs to develop networks, to carry out innovations would depend partly on internal strength and partly on the external support that they can access and obtain in the region or in the locality in which they operate. Now this is because firms succeed, but then of course, uh, as I, ha I have already told you that a significant chunk, they do not have even threshold level of competence. I am keeping them aside. I'm looking, I would like to look at only SMEs which have the threshold level of competence now, but then they are not getting uh, external support. Now, but if such firms, if they succeed you know, in obtaining external support, they will be able to innovate, they will be able to internationalize. But then if we need to create an environment where there is an adequate support system, then we need to, uh, no, we, we, first we have to ensure that whether such regions do have at least a cluster of firms and other stakeholders in the region. Uh, it need, uh, but then not all regions need to comprise clusters and not all regional clusters need to encourage innovation. So in this context, let me define two concepts. One is regional cluster, another one is regional innovation. A regional cluster, it is a mere concentration of interdependent forms within the same industry or related industries in a small geographical region, such as a town or a city. Whereas a regional innovation system is beyond a regional cluster of firms. It has a more planned and systemic character. So in general, a regional innovation system consists of firms of varying sizes in diverse industries and universities or academic institutes interacting with each other for knowledge generation and technology transfer supported by a regional government and a conducive culture within an institutional framework. Uh, this is how a typical regeneration system is defined. So we, we have universities on the one hand, which generate knowledge, and we have businesses on the other, which utilize that knowledge. So demand for technological knowledge actually emerges from businesses and technology transfer happens from universities to businesses. Now this kind of interaction is facilitated by a regional government subsystem and a regional culture. Now businesses, they will have interactions with the external world through exports and investments, 
whereas universities will have inter constant interactions with the external world through you know, you know, dissemination of the knowledge created and learning from the external institutions. Now, do we have uh, RICs? Do we have RCs? Well, first let us look at the kind of clustering of SMEs uh, that is existing in our country. According to the statistics of the Ministry of MSMEs, there are about 388 SME clusters in the country, of which 112 clusters are confined or located in eight metropolitan cities, such as the National Capital Region. I have taken the liberty to define National Capital Region slightly broadly to comprise Delhi, Faridabad, Gurgaon, Noida, and Ghaziabad followed by Ahmedabad, Mumbai, Pune, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, and Kolkata. So they account for 112 clusters. Another 100 clusters are located in 26 different cities across the country. So together, these two, 212 clusters, they account for about 55% of the total number of clusters in the country. Now, now, I'm sure they would account for majority of the small scale and medium scale enterprises in the registered sector in the country. Now, my argument is we need to focus on these clusters, uh, these clusters of SMEs in the country. Now, the argument further is all the eight metros, they are likely to comprise regional innovation system of, of one kind or the other with varying strengths. Whereas the, the other 26 cities which comprise uh, uh, remaining 100 clusters, they must just comprise the regional clusters, but have the potential to develop into a regional innovation system. Now, the pertinent question is, what kind of a regional innovation system we have in our metro cities? Is there anything to learn from that? So it is here in that context that I would like to make reference to the regional innovation system as I have observed in the context of Bangalore. Now Bangalore attracts attention because Bangalore is a unique tech city of our country. Now in 2001, that is as far back as in 2001, UNDP in its annual report recognized Bangalore as one of the 46 global hubs of technological innovation. It has a very, a very rare, and it, is a, it has a significant base of R&D affiliates of TNCs. Now, it has several Fortune 500 companies. Now, broadly, if you see, it has a strong regional government, supportive regional government, comprising various SSI promoting agencies, strong industry base, comprising TNCs, public sector undertakings, private companies of varying sizes, very strong and active industry associations. And we have a strong base of angels, VCs, private equities, private sector banks, and then to come uh, to supplement that, we have a strong R&D center uh, base that is TNC R&D affiliates, public sector R&D institutes, domestic private company R&D labs. And we have academic research institutes like IAC, IIITB, IAM, and we have nearly 60 engineering institutions, various management institutes, institutions, science, art, and commerce colleges. Now, all of these have enabled Bangalore-based SMEs to develop networks for undertaking innovations and a significant chunk of them have, have actually entered the international market. Some of them are even linked to the BVCs of TNCs. Now I will say significant chunk because according to the Visheshwara Industrial Trade Center, which actually maintains trade statistics, which provides figures for export oriented SMEs, more than three fourths of the exporting SMEs of Karnataka are located in Bangalore. But then emulating Bangalore will be a challenge. The strategy and experience of Bangalore RIS based SMEs can be a lesson to emulate elsewhere in the country. But emulating Bangalore, even remotely if possible, can only be a long-term strategy. Now the issue is, what, what do we do? In fact, support to SMEs has to be provided uh, not only at the start of phase, but in subsequent stages as well. I have made reference to the UK industry strategy here, but then that is a, a developed country. Now, among the developing economies, we know, uh, know what has impressed me the most is the network and innovation support extended through a R&D public service platform by provided by Shanghai Municipality Science and Technology Commission in China. Now, that, that actually provides a wide variety of services which 
invariably prompt SMEs in the local cluster to network itself with various agencies and undertake innovations and enable, and enable itself to enter the international market. Now, it aims to provide a wide variety of support services to SMEs similar to those found in developed countries. Such a support system must be created in each of the regional clusters in India to enable the networking of SMEs for innovation to penetrate the international markets. Now, that is this is how the Shanghai R&D public service platform would look like. I have quoted this from a World Bank report. You know, you, you, the social security, equipment sharing, testing-based cooperation, professional technology, industry testing, it enables technology transfer, entrepreneurial support of various kinds, including incubation, management decision-making support, science and technology literature provide scientific figure sharing. So various kinds of support is provided. When this support is readily available in the local market, MNC, so start, uh, SMEs will be tempted to make use of such support, such a support system to improve their competence to enable themselves to reach the international market. Now, suppose we succeed, then, it will be the scenario will be something like this. If you are able to create a strong and vibrant regional innovation system in each of the uh, each of the uh, regional clusters of SMEs, then there will be increased regional networks of SMEs with, that is in the form of vertical linkages with customers and suppliers and horizontal linkages with higher education institutions, R&D institutions, industry associations, and other SMEs. Now, that will really enable them to improve their innovations qualitatively. Many of them may be able to transform their incremental innovations into radical innovations in the form of product and high quality product and process innovations that itself will give confidence to enter the international market and penetrate the global value chains of TNCs. I'm sure this will have several questions and not elaborated everything here, but if questions come, I should be able to uh, treat them well. So to conclude, uh, network and innovation policy support to offset the internal deficiencies of SMEs by providing accessible and productive innovation infrastructure for firms at different stages of their life cycle locally would largely enable the emergence of innovation flourishing environment for the benefit of SMEs to steadily penetrate the GVCs of TNCs through internationalization. If appropriate measures are not taken at the earliest by the policymakers involving the key stakeholders of the economy, the current status of Indian SMEs in the form of limited presence in the global economy would only continue. Now, any amount of tinkering with the system in the form of more concessions, more incentives, and more benefits which is the current policy pattern. It has been the policy pattern in our country for quite some, quite some time. It would hardly alter the status quo. So with these words, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bala Subramanya. It was such a wonderful and clear presentation. And uh, uh, there are a number of questions that are coming up and yeah. uh, so certainly uh, thank you so much for your for your presentation um, yeah. uh, professor dev uh, should we open the floor for discussion and then uh, we can go to the how do you want to do it do you want to have the discussions first come in and then open discussion yes uh, would that be okay yeah yeah first have the discussions please yes Great. So uh, thank you again, uh, Professor. And I invite uh, Ketan Reddy uh, to share his views on the lecture and uh, his, his own reflections. I would like to introduce Ketan to you. He's a research scholar in economics at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He was a visiting scholar at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research. He holds an MSc in economics from Pondicherry Central University, and uh, he was the recipient of the first vice chancellor, Dr. KVS Gold Medal. In fact, his doctoral research work, uh, he's examining the role of global value chains and the implications it has for India. So certainly we have a lot uh, to hear from you. And uh, over to you, Ketan. Welcome. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, let me also thank uh, Professor Balasubramaniam for a very detailed and insightful presentation, uh, focusing on the challenges of SMEs, uh, especially in the context of their decision to participate in value chains and what is holding them back. Um, uh, one uh, uh, thing which was very prominent from Sir's presentation is the importance of innovation, uh, which, which he brings to the forefront, forefront. And I think it is extremely important uh, because innovation is something that could help MSMEs transform as being a good participants in GVC, which would help India achieve the target of 5 trillion economy, given that Sir also showed how huge a contribution MSME have to the Indian economy. So on the presentation, I have a few points and then a few questions or a few things I would like Sir's thoughts on. So starting by the comments that I have, uh, in the beginning, Sir points that uh, a figure which says that 0.2% of MSMEs in India participate in GVC. Uh, so looking at that figure, it is a very small number given the extent, vast majority of firms in India being MSMEs. So the picture becomes even more gloomier because once we think of the kind of participation these firms are having into global value chains, these are not directly participating in GVCs. They're, they're, they're rather integrating with large domestic firms, which are therefore integrated with transnational corporations and th thereby forming the global value chain. Uh, so in this regard, the gains that MSMEs are getting is probably much more lower. So this figure becomes even more gloomier once we put that into perspective. And I think it becomes important that we try to get MSMEs to participate in value chain through a direct channel rather than the intermediate way. Uh, the second point, and which was also the core of Sir's presentation, which he spoke on innovation. So just a few more uh, statistics on them and few more thoughts to support his fact. Uh, the last World Development Report 2020, which focuses solely on global value chains, it highlights that in 2017, around 65% of the trade that is happening in the present day is in products which never existed prior to 1992. So that itself tells you the amount of innovation that has been happening and gives a scope for every developing economies and the firms from them to try to innovate as a channel of leapfrogging their status from low developing countries to low middle low income to higher middle income. So that point which Sir's bring forth is, is probably one of the most key takeaway from the presentations for me. Uh, another important aspect which Sir points out uh, is about the regional clusters where the agglomeration effects could be seen and they could help SMEs and any firm participating in a agglomeration be more productive, which could therefore help them participate, you know, the uh, standard trade merits model, which talks about the self-selection. So there we know that productivity is an important factor in which drives GVC participation of the firm. So that is an important policy takeaway. If we could get those regional cl clusters up and running and more, more catering to MSMEs, that would be a very good uh, policy aspect for improving the MSME integration into GVCs. So that being my take on Sir's presentation, I have a few questions myself. Uh, so Sir rightly, so, Sir was talking about how innovation requires external support and how networking plays a very important role. In this regard, what is Sir's take on the present FDI stance of the country where a lot of foreign investment is coming in and a lot of FDI is open in terms of there is 100% openness. So a firm can come and invest as a greenfield FDI. But if we have to take cues from China, we see that a lot of that development also happened because they were forced to form joint ventures with the domestic company. And that in essence leads to a greater technological spillover, which in turn would lead to more domestic innovation. So to an extent, it might even boost domestic inv innovation investments by firms, may not be MSMEs, they may not be in a position to invest so much in R&D, but at least the large subsector of them. So I, on that regard, do you, do you think that trying to come up with a policy which sort of promotes joint ventures with these MSMEs would help them more technological, more make them more added to the technological advancements, which could then further their gains in GVC participation. Uh, Can I answer uh, it later? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Keetan, yeah. are you done? Uh, I have a couple more if, if, if that's fine. Oh, okay, yeah. please go ahead qu uh, quickly. Uh, again, uh, in terms of the strategy and trying to integrate, we are also seeing the role of automation and industry 4.0 that has been coming up. And especially after now the COVID outbreak that has happened and firms are, would try to cut their labor costs and move towards automation. It certainly has employment effects also, but it also has implications for them to be able to push their participation in GVC. But if that has to be adopted, the current digital infrastructure in the country may not be at that stance. So do you think going forward three years, five years down the line, 
automation adoption or industry 4.0 as it's been said could be a way forward of getting these msmes competitive enough to integrate into gvcs uh, one more point uh, that uh, we see is over the past few budgets also we have seen that the tariffs on imported inputs intermediate inputs which are then used for production has been on the rise and on the other hand we also have an open fdi policy where we are attracting more foreign investment sure. so if if these to be are, are to taken in a similar picture it does not show a picture where we are promoting firms to participate in gvcs because yes. intermediate inputs is a very important aspect of technological spillover as well and also getting the manufacturing and assembly sector right because every firm only later on moves up the value chain so yes. what is what are your thoughts on the present or the inverted tariff that exists in the in the market because it has been on the rise and that could be a deterrent for msmes uh, decision to participate in gvcs and yes. one one uh, final uh, question that i have or rather a thought i would like you to give me is uh, india we had we had this protection policy policy where, where certain products from small scale industries were protected and gradually they have been phased out so after 2015 it has been more open so do you think that has helped because we know it has helped makes lot of firms more competitive but had because uh, the figures also showed that the export has been negligible so though they have created employment they have become more competitive <laughs> but why is it that we are not able to see them getting translated into exports so that would be from my answer thank you so much for your presentation i look forward to hearing to you great thank you ketan and uh, sir uh, we would like to invite dr radhika also uh, and then you could take the questions yes. together and your, their observations so uh, dr radhika pande holds a phd in economics she is a consultant with the macro finance group at the national institute of public finance and policy nipfp in new delhi and she has been a part of a number of research teams of the ministry of finance instituted expert committees such as the financial legislative reforms commission panel on external commercial borrowings and report of the Gro uh, working group on foreign investments in india uh, we are delighted to have you dr pande over to you uh, thank you dr simi for that uh, introduction and uh, thank you professor uh, balasubramanian for that enriching uh, discussion on such a pertinent issue of uh, uh, small scale industry and why they are not part of the global value chain of the transnational corporations uh, i fully agree with all the points that were uh, raised because these are fundamental points that uh, you know affect the msme performance in the country uh, firstly because msmes by nature if you look at the uh, character of msmes fundamentally they are uh, small an overwhelmingly large proportion of msmes are uh, micro in nature within the micro enterprises also a large proportion of them are tiny that's they are holding just you know uh, they are employing one or two persons uh, employment so to enable them to become part of the global value chain uh, is a very challenging task and uh, you know there are lots of challenges that Uh, you have pointed out uh, what i would like to add to that to supplement to the discussion in on this pertinent issue is the kind of government assistance that have been provided uh, on these issues you know to enable uh, msmes become more efficient more competitive what kind of uh, assistance government has provided what kind of schemes government has uh, 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 started for these uh, uh, policies and program and what needs to be done because we uh, have done some uh, research on this uh, especially with regard to clusters because cluster is a very important uh, way of improving the efficiency and productivity of uh, msme uh, but what we see is that you know there is a dedicated scheme for cluster development program for uh, msme uh, which focuses on on two special aspects first is it provides common facility centers and second is provides infrastructure development now if we look at the number of schemes there are quite a, la a large number of schemes but in terms of performance they are geographically lopsided for example as you pointed out that uh, you know that uh, there are a lot of clusters uh, in the delhi ncr region but in terms of uh, common facility centers we do not have uh, these common facility centers in uh, the delhi ncr region so there is a kind of a mismatch between where uh, there is a majority concentration of msmes and uh, you know the scheme uptake the utilization of uh, schemes by these msmes by these smes in these cluster what prevents them from utilizing these scheme is a very critical issue 
to which requires an overview of the scheme, which requires a critical appraisal of the scheme. So one such scheme is cluster development program, which though is, uh, uh, is prevalent, but it needs to be seen what more needs to be done to improve its efficiency. The second important uh, point that you rightly raised is the role of innovations and uh, role, the promotion of entrepreneurial skill. And towards that also we have an important scheme, which is Aspire, which aims to develop incubators. Again, here the problem is that again it is uh, it is uh, cited and we find most of the incubators in the southern region we don't find in the northern region or central uh, uh, region of the country. So again, that's a problem. And it, uh, in in this this entire discussion about uh, why MSMEs are not part of the global value chain, uh, an important critical dimension that needs to be covered is what are the kind of scheme and what needs to be done to improve the efficiency of uh, these government schemes. Second important aspect that should be there is that, you know, uh, the, the, there needs to be a relevant up-to-date database on the performance of these schemes and how those MSMEs, those who have taken up these schemes, how they've started performing. So the, the, these, I just wanted to add some points to you know, further enrich the discussion about how uh, you know, Indian MSMEs can become part of the global value chain. So one part is you know, the discussion that we had in this uh, presentation. The other part is what are the kind of assistance available and what further can be done to improve the uh, you know, effectiveness and uptake of those schemes uh, by the MSMEs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Uh, yes, <clears throat> Professor Dave, can we have your views, please, so that uh, you could uh, now guide the whole discussion process? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Welcome, thank you, Professor Bala Subramanya and, the, and our discussants, Radhika and Ketan. Uh, I have a few points I would like to add to the discussion and hope that in the open discussion and Dr. Subramanya in his remarks, in his replies would take care of some of these things. Now, so far the discussion has one largely been about the supply of knowledge or innovation services. My question is, what about the demand for innovation? What about the demand for knowledge services? Is there a problem of insufficient demand for knowledge services. For instance, Radhika pointed out that there are many schemes which are not utilized, particularly in the northern part of this country in the clusters. So there is there are schemes for certain common services, but you don't find them coming up because there's not enough demand. So we need to look not just at the supply side of the of innovation facilities, but also the demand for innovation. That's one point. Secondly, related to the question of demand for innovation is that of firm strategy. Because we have to go to the firm strategy. Why do the firms not have a strategy that requires a demand for innovation? Under what conditions can we develop <clears throat> or nudge firms to move in the direction of requiring innovation in their uh, practices. Now, in the early days of GVC-based industrialization in Korea and in East, East Asia, there was one policy they followed, which was that they required firms that got benefits from the government to export a certain portion of their output. Obviously, in order to export, they had to meet certain quality standards. So in a way, quality standards were enforced by the requirement to export. Now, at present, we cannot have a policy like this because the WTO rules do not allow you to link various incentives to the export requirement. You cannot do that by the current WTO rules. So can we find some way around it? For instance, can we have certain quality requirements which will allow exports, but not themselves be directly related to exports? Simply, for instance, in the automobile sector, you have the different environment requirements. Okay, you have Euro 4, you have Euro 5. So can we require our, autom our, our automotive sector 
to make Euro 5 or whatever is the latest Euro or other uh, emission standards so that they are able to export. Now, then they will then there will be a demand for a certain kind of uh, innovation or knowledge if not innovation certain kind of innovation to be able to meet those standards so i would suggest i would request that uh, dr subramanian if you could also look into the question of what is the what is holding back the demand for innovation as you put it or i would say the demand for innovation services in the sme sector to add to this point i would just point out i'll give an example from the garment industry which i have looked into now we have a large number you know we have a very large domestic value chain or domestic market for garments but they generally are of a much lower value than except of course for the designer products which are different but otherwise the mass market which there is is of much lower value and the production system is also quite different i remember visiting one such area in delhi where they produce for the domestic market and i asked the owner why does he not think of grow, expanding and producing for the export market he said look that requires a very different type of production i'll have to completely set up a new factory which i don't have while he's he was happy with continuing with producing for the domestic market which did not have the same quality requirements where you know if if the size waist size 33 was well, also maybe 34 or 30 uh, you know or 31 it didn't really matter too much but if you are exporting you cannot have a standard a, a poor quality of that type so one has to look into it that you know a large number of smes are in low value production and therefore they are not capable of exporting in order to be able to export you will have to require them to move to higher value production not high value items but higher quality and at a lower price level at a price level which is compatible with the international market so i would just like to add to the discussion the point about how to increase the demand for knowledge services and before i hand over to uh, Dr. Subramanian, again, I would just like to request, I can see among the attendees, Akhilesh Sharma is here. Akhilesh is from ISID, and I know he has been working on this question of why do SMEs not grow? That's a little bit akin to the point uh, problem I put before you. So maybe at a, during the open discussion, Akhilesh may also have a few points to say. I would request him to add his uh, knowledge to this discussion. Uh, over to you, Dr. Subramanya, to respond to this round of comments and questions. And then we can have in, from the floor some further comments and questions. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I respond? Shall I respond to first Dr. Reddy's uh, comments? See, yeah, please, in, in, a, in any order that you would like. Yeah, because uh, Dr. Reddy first made reference to uh, you know, the idea of uh, promoting or encouraging uh, TNCs to go for joint ventures with the, with the local SMEs. See, such kind of an encouragement may not really yield dividends. I will tell you, this, it is because See, we have conducted a study focusing on the subcontractors of Toyota, Volvo, and Bosch. Now, where we also explored how did they actually reach out to these, uh, these subcontractors. What they did, they did not go based on anybody's recommendation. Of course, through word of mouth, they heard about the efficient producers available in the, in the local market. Then the Toyota representative approached some of these SMEs and posed them a challenge by you know, giving a component and asking them whether they can produce a similar component at a lesser cost. Now, many of these competent producers, they took it as a challenge. They produced the components demanded by the TNCs at a lower price and made them satis now satisfied. And that is how they established longer relationship with Toyota and Volvo or Bosch subsequently. So then how to, how to uh, I don't know I, whether I'm going to answer all the questions, but I have suggested one thing because I'm on the, uh, I'm in a relationship with the many of the engineering institutions in the region. What I suggested them is in the engineering institution, every 
undergrad has to carry out a, a, a project work for six months. Now, many of them are simply problems given by the faculty members with no real value. So I have suggested to them that it's based on experience that or knowledge that I have about some of the departments in IAC. Now, what the, is some of these departments in the IAC do, they force every student to bring a live problem from the industry. This happens particularly in the electronics industry and the engineering or the mechanical engineering industry now. These department students, they go to the industrial estates, interact with the SME owners, pick up a live problem, come and formulate the problem you know, as required by the academic assignment, solve that problem and prepare the report. So in the process, many of the SMEs have got linked to the departments of IAS. Now, some of those SMEs, they are able to innovate and climb up the value chain. Now, in, in keeping that in the backdrop, I suggested to several engineering institutions that your undergrad students must pick up live problems from your own city-based SMEs. That will enable the faculty members to understand the live problem and offer solutions. And many SMEs would get cost-effective solutions. It is that kind of industry institute interaction that we need to promote across the country to the benefit of SMEs particularly, uh, SMEs particularly and D1, it will indirectly benefit academic inst engineering institution professors as well as students. If we do that on a steady basis, I'm sure many SMEs will be able to improve their quality. I'm sure more and more government schools, schemes, policies, incentives may not work. Of course, I have suggested Shanghai model, but the Shanghai model has to come in a, in a, in a forceful way to win over the confidence of the SMEs. That is why I said tinkering with the system by introducing a, one more policy, one more scheme, one more project will not make any impact on the SMEs and they will not be able to you know, when win over the confidence of SMEs. You need to consciously, cleverly promote industry institute interaction, enable SMEs to, you know, so that is the first stage of networking with institutions. And if needed, a group of SMEs can be brought together along with the academic institutes. And if they solve problem, if they achieve success, that will be a stepping stone to further success. So in an incremental way, if we go ahead, I'm sure industry institute interaction can be promoted, which will enable them to improve their quality of their products, quality of their innovations, and maybe develop more links with, with maybe TNCs located in the regional market, and then Um, we, have lost him. we have lost. Yes. Uh, Which recommended them to the Professor international Bala? market and they are able to. Sorry, Professor Bala, for interrupting you. We lost you for uh, last one minute. Uh, could you check your connection, please? And if, we, if you could repeat what you said. Could, can you hear me, Professor? Uh, I think there is an issue. Uh, I'll just connect. Uh, I'll just reconnect. Um, Meanwhile, uh, can we have uh, Akhilesh, sir, for uh, until sir joins? Actually, Akhilesh, sir, was having some throat issues. Is uh, sir, are you able to hear me, Doctor Akhilesh Sharma? Hello. Am I? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So please pull your pull your screen a bit down towards it. Yes. Uh, yes. Is it 
Is it? It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir, and good evening to the, uh, everyone. Uh, it was indeed a very uh, interesting presentation. And um, uh, first, I would like to answer the few questions, and which includes the answer of uh, uh, Devanathan sir as well. That uh, the low utilization of the government schemes and the lack of innovations in MSMEs. Uh, these are the very important issue, and uh, we need to address it. Uh, but uh, if you see the slides of uh, presentation by Professor Subramaniam, uh, it uh, basically the it is focusing on the small and medium enterprises, which comprises of 0.5 percent, and 99.5 percent are the micro enterprises and uh, with workers one or two. Uh, so, if you see the why uh, they are not going there, the answer is here. Because the micro enterprises, they are the owner of their workers of their firm. If you, they are leaving their enterprise and going for the training uh, or uh, at the incubation centers, definitely it will affect their the production activities and services activities. So, there is the less incentive for them. Uh, as uh, one of the professors mentioned, that they are, the focus is the local demand and the regional demand, not the uh, export or not the uh, international uh, demand. So that's why uh, they lack the incentive here. But before that, the other important issue is the low registration. Only around 30% of MSMEs are registered. So with this low registration, they are not able to avail the benefit of the all the government schemes or the benefit, benefit of the any initiatives either in terms of at the incubation centers or the tools or the technology centers and others. They are not able to avail it, the first point. And the second point, they, there is a huge lack of awareness due to the low registration. So this, this low registration, or you can say the low, uh, high level of informality, basically in the MSME sector is affecting the performance of the small and medium enterprises at uh, 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 this, uh, this point. And, uh, and third, uh, third point, which I want to highlight here, I agree with the Professor Subramaniam uh, that uh, just having the Hello. scheme in the name of the scheme uh, is not uh, going to solve so the problem of the MSMEs. Uh, for that, I would like to highlight the MSME Hello? 59 uh, scheme that yeah, was yeah, launched by yeah. the government with huge campaign. But when we interacted with the banks uh, and the MSME owners also, they told that we had the pressure from the government to make it, to show it a success scheme. And that's why the banks were registering their the old customers for under the MSME 59 themselves. The registration was not done by the MSME owners, but the purpose was that to provide an online platform to the MSME owners and to get the benefit in, uh, to get the in principle sanction loan. And again here, the uh, misinformation was among the people that they are going to get the loan in 59 minutes. So there is, uh, you can say, the wrong information, wrong advertisement, wrong perception from uh, about the schemes from the government side as well as from the entrepreneurs also. That's why people are not able to get uh, the benefit, timely benefit, and appropriate benefit. So there is a need for a multi-stakeholder discussion, uh, as Professor uh, Subramanian has mentioned that industry, government official, and the academia uh, the, to design a policy, just not for the sake of the new policy for the political purpose. This is not going to, going to serve, the, serve the purpose. And, the, and for improving the performance of the MSME, MSME and you know, innovation and to incorporate in the global production network, there is a need to increase the formality, uh, for the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, formality in, in the sector and increase the registration process and make it in such a way that people get the timely information about their market, about the government schemes. And definitely, if we work in the coordinated approach, uh, it, it will uh, improve the performance of the MSMEs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akhilesh. Uh, Professor Bala, we lost you for a bit. Yeah, yeah. If you could, uh, yes, please yeah. continue. Yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to you know, emphasize on the point that mere introduction of more and more policies, schemes, projects will not work. Yeah. What is really important is to enable SMEs to you know, get support from the academic institutions and you know, 
so that they'll be able to you know do projects uh, uh, together so i was actually giving the example of some of the departments that iac in iac that they are doing they emph lay emphasis on a student bringing a live problem from the industry so the, this invariably forces a student go to go to the industrial estates to go to the industrial area pick up a live problem from industry now do an academic formulation present it get it accepted by the faculty solve it to the you know to the satisfaction of the industry then write a report now this has made a good impact in the sense many industries now are collaborating with iisc because these student projects actually have led them to many faculty members so i do lay emphasis on these in various engineering institutions where i go and give talks i tell them look you are undergrad and postgraduate students they have to do projects six months project so encourage the students along with the faculty to identify a live problem of a industry in most cases it will be an sme in the in the regional cluster context solve them to their satisfaction get them closer to your institute it will be mutually beneficial that is how you help industry to to let us say to network to innovate and improve their quality so that would largely you know give a new dimension to the sme policy in the country the current strategy is only to introduce one more committee one more policy one more plan one more report ending with ending with nothing they don't achieve anything out of it please note if you take the expert committee reports in the last three decades they have told the same thing repeatedly and we are not able to change it so the best strategy will be to bring them closer to institutes consciously and 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 see this this will also get them virtually costless benefits they need not uh, uh, rather invest anything because the student has to solve the academic problem formulated by him with the help of the industry and provided them a solution and write the report so if hundreds of thousands of students if they go and identify an industry problem it will be to the advantage of locally clustered firms for their innovation and many of them might enter the international market i have many examples in the iac context but i can quote some of them in fact one sme which actually is, is was started by an alumni of iisc you now collaborated very well with the with the departments and they they could reach the us market well they are exporters to the us market and please know initially nobody was you know willing to enter allow them into an exhibition then one american company company came forward exhibited their products they could penetrate and they could grow so i have several instances because i have conducted several case studies I, we have also conducted surveys on smes so mere government policy announcement or government forming and forming another agency or coming out with another scheme will not produce any result it will only end up with failure as we have got used to uh, i have forgotten other questions if you can briefly tell i can <laughs> i can try to answer right i will attempt to answer those questions i am not telling that i have ready answers to that yes. and uh, that in this context i would say ketan reddy suggestion of you no know, imposing some kind of you no know, joint venture conditions on tncs located in different parts of the country may not help they yes. they will they will not be uh, keen to pursue that strategy at all right uh so um, one more and, point uh, yeah yes, simi please. can i add one point yes please sir yeah. briefly uh there was one question uh, by uh, professor devnathan that why msmes are not growing and that is uh, also important the um, when we interacted with around uh, 200 msmes particularly in delhi and uh, uh, up we observed that uh, msmes are basically following the herd mentality hard mentality means if a particular msme is successful in particular in a in an area and uh, after visualizing their success the other similar kind of smes uh, producing engaged in the similar the same type of activities are coming forward so what is happening that since they have the objective of meeting the local demand and regional demand 
so if the new enterprises are coming with the similar kind of products and services it is basically reducing the profitability or distributing the prof profitability among these four and this is affecting the overall profitability of the msmes and that's why after few years uh, some firms become sick or some uh, some firms uh, uh, shut, uh, shut down uh, themselves since in india majority of the msmes are micro enterprises so that's why uh, this its effect is more on them and they are, they are not able to revive themselves and given the other problems of their the capital access to capital and uh, access to information access to uh, proper access to government schemes awareness and other all these issues make their problem more trivial and and this is uh, affecting uh, the, their performance we should not go for the success stories of the few firms if you try to see across the firms you will uh, i think we uh, we can find Uh, that uh, the herd mentality basically the herd herd mentality is affecting their behavior other factor that is that we as a society we are not uh, um, giving respect to the failure cases so that is what happening what is happening people are not coming forward to take the risk or innovation or uh, more entre entre entrepreneurial behavior uh, in a society only the few people are become success and other people become failure then the society is not giving them the appropriate respect so that they can take further initiative further incentive to come forward and that's why it is restricting the people to come forward for the innovative behavior and taking the risk and uh, going for the you know uh, innovation this is my own observation from the field sir great sir thank you thank you so much uh, professor dev would you like to add Well, I just like to pose the question again to <clears throat> Bala. That is, do you think there's a question, there's a problem of a low demand for innovation from the firms that you have been looking at, particularly in various clusters across the country? Leave aside the micro enterprises that Akhilesh is mentioning. Micro is really a very different kind of area, but the SMEs and particularly even the medium ones. Now there is a problem of rates of return. as akilesh pointed out when you have a process innovation and others copy it very quickly your excess profit uh, vanishes and you will then get back to the same average profit level which is low so there is no big uh, there is no big incentive for innovation now the point is there is an incentive however and that incentive lies in growing because i have seen in garment factories that the ones that grow are the ones that are more efficient and they are it's very much linked so the small firms then remain as they are the the larger firms don't get a higher rate of return their rates of return are the same 8 9 10% 10%, as you find with the small firms but the benefit they get is of a larger order their volumes have gone up so the question of how do we change the demand for <coughs> innovation would you like to say a few uh, well sir we have conducted a study on engineering smes in bangalore where you found that those who are innovative they were actually growing faster and they were more into product innovations so this also uh, i i would like to also uh, answer the question of uh, dr reddy that is about the impact of automation impact of automation of course is causing disruption but it's also creating new opportunities so and innovation many of the smes they start only incremental innovation in response to the direction or the demands of the customers so only when they succeed they grow no SME on its own will immediately or straight away get into radical innovation. I fully agree with Professor Devanathan. There is an issue, and in that context, I do not think garment industry is appropriate because garment industry, the kind of innovation scope may be limited, but innovation scope is much more in an engineering industry, in terms of products, in terms of processes. But both they will resort to only when initially when there is adequate customer demand. only when they succeed when they taste the fruits of success they proceed further and in very few cases they go for radical innovation the challenge is how to convert 
a large number of incremental innovators into radical innovators. Again, I have a couple of success stories to tell. There's a company in, in Mysore called Oscar Microns, started by two former employees of Kirloskar Mysore industry. Now they have innovated several auto components and they have started exporting. So the large company did not appreciate their idea. They killed the company. They started an auto component company. They have innovated auto components. They have entered the export market. So in, in such cases, it is mostly self-motivation. So very few of them who have tasted success, they are radical innovators. So I do not agree with the argument that there's no demand for the innovation of SMEs. So in fact, a successful innovator matches technological capability with market demand. It is his or her responsibility to identify the market as well. That is precisely why some of them try to reach the international market when they do not find adequate market in the domestic economy. Right, sir. Right. Um... Yes, Professor Dave. No, would you like to ask someone else yes. from the attendees if they have any yes. questions? Yes, sir, there are a few questions if I could pose them uh, to the panel uh, and to Professor Bala as well, and uh, you could take them up uh, based on your choice. So uh, one question is, uh, what is the scope of women-led enterprises in the GVCs? And uh, similar to that is another question uh, to what you, Professor. What of of women-led, uh, Professor Bala, women-led small enterprises. Professor Bala, can you hear me? Uh, okay, so there's another technical glitch, I think. So um, we'll continue. Uh, this, uh, this question is directed to Professor Dave also, if you would also like to take it. How do you reconcile the gender relations misfit in the SMEs? Is it that the women, uh, is it that women do not have the required resources or that their enterprises are not se seriously considered? Uh, is there a threat that they may do better in the GVCs or um, how do you reconcile this whole uh, framework? Uh, Professor Bala, are you able to hear me out? Um, so, uh, Professor Dave, if you could uh, uh, see if you could uh, respond to that. In the meanwhile, I'll just connect with Professor Bala again. Yeah, okay. Now, the question of women led enterprises in GVCs, I don't think that we have not noticed any big difference. I mean, there are uh, women-led firms which have done quite well in GVCs and it's not that they have particularly they, faced I'm, a different I'm trying type to join. Of it got cut. Uh, I'm trying yes. to join again. It got cut. Yes, sir. No issues. Yeah, no issues. Yeah. Please. Okay. So shall we allow Professor Bala to now get back to his... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. So I was, uh, Professor Dave, if you could continue and then I'll take the next set of questions. Uh, no, that was it. I don't have too much to say on okay. this topic that we have not okay. seen any particular problems faced by women-led GV, you know, enterprises in entering GVCs compared mm -hmm. to men-led enterprises. Mm -hmm. We don't really see that. And they, they have both performed to either well or not so well. It has okay. not changed with that. Uh, so there are a number of women-led uh, factories which are very important suppliers and have done very well as suppliers and have been able to move into various product areas. The big problem, of course, is the question of innovation. And there, there are innovative uh, producers, whether it is, you know, it's not, they, they are not in the, they are suppliers largely to the large firms. They are not independent producers and not those which are, which are establishing their own, like the example given by Professor Bala of the 
uh, the, the, the two automotive component uh, producers. I'm sure those two producers have got some kind of IPR protect, uh, protection, yes. some kind yes. of intellect patents. Correct. So yeah. that they would be able to get a higher profit rate yes. because yes. of their patented products rather right. than those producers who are producing run-of-the-mill products for which right. there are really no right. protection right. rights. So that is a different, that is an important path that why uh, when you have have in, uh, firms that go on the route of securing uh, or developing technologies for which they can secure monopoly protection and therefore get a higher rate of return. That's a very okay. important way okay. of growing. Okay, I'll hand over Thank to you. Bala now to carry on with his comments or responses yes. to the uh, comments. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. the next. I, I agree uh, with the observations made by Professor Devanathan. Uh, the enterprises or the innovators whom I have suggested, they all have gone for patents. They have obtained patents. Particularly Oscar Microns, I said, they have repeatedly obtained patents. Mm. So those who are confident of their radical innovations, product innovations, they have gone for patents. Right, so Very few of them are there. And regarding the, yes, women entrepreneurs, yes. Uh, best example is Mrs. Mrs. Umar Reddy from Bangalore. She, she's doing pretty well. And in fact, you know, uh, such entrepreneurs are there. Uh, we actually awake promotes women entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But I have no idea how many women entrepreneurs are there in what sectors. I do not know. But Mrs. Sumar Reddy is in the electronics industry sector, if I'm right. Right, sir. Uh, so, uh, so what are the risks that the SMEs may expose themselves to direct investments in the GVCs? Can mm -hmm. there be a co in the in the GVCs? Are there any risks to uh, direct investments? And uh, the next question is that, um, can there be a cooperative relationship between SMEs in India? Because uh, you have spoken about the Bangalore uh, case. What about the rest of India? For instance, the Northeast, which is a little um, you know, neglected. Are they on the losing end? What strategy can be adopted? And uh, similar question is that, what is the best practice that the regional clusters in India can adopt? Uh, or or the, does the setting up of regional sectors would lead to uh, unnecessary competition, thereby defeating the purpose for Not which- necessary. I will tell you the kind of diseconomies of scale complaint given against the SMEs can be overcome by SMEs in the same sector coming together and reaching out to, let us say, international market chains. In fact, you would be knowing that um, our Walmart has a procurement center in Bangalore. It procures many of the consumer products from the SMEs located in Bangalore, including garments. So in fact, many of the international buyers, for them the problem is a single SME will not be able to cater to their demand. It is in such cases, that industry associations promoted a group of SMEs can come together and try to reach out to the demand of these global suppliers. So it is possible for SMEs to, to come together. But however, if you ask me, I don't have any instance where SMEs have come together spontaneously and responded to the demands of a large customer. I don't have any really example, but it is possible. Right. Yeah. One of so the then, objectives of, let us say, in, in Bangalore, we have a very active small scale industry association called KASIA, Karnataka Small Scale Industries Association. It, of course, it has, it is known for several other reasons, but one reason is it has a very active membership meetings, members meetings who interact, who discuss about the changing government policies, about the changing market trends, and they also have their own uh, subcontracting promotion center supported right. by the government of India. Right, right, sir. Thank you. Uh, so then there is a, com a concern from a couple of um, people in the audience when you are talking about incubation. There is a certain, some amount of favoritism towards certain industries due to which other industries get neglected. How will policies and schemes support these sectors? And another question related to it to be is frank with you, incubators. See, I have recently conducted a study covering accelerators, incubators, and co-working spaces in Bangalore, Chennai, and Hyderabad. For your kind information, 
most of these incubators are underfilled. In other words, there are several empty spaces. I'm talking about incubation incubators meant for tech startups. Many of them have empty seats. This is true for co-working spaces. This is true for incubators, not for accelerators because corporate accelerators, they do their own pickups because the objective of corporate accelerator is to promote their own profits, their own business. So whichever tech startup is, is uh, what you can say is in line with their objective, they will promote them through their accelerator. I'm talking about incubators, which are based in academic institutes promoted by academic institutes and co-working spaces in general. None of them is filled 100%. Some are not filled even 50%. So uh, that's a different story. I'm not, I don't know whether they're referring to TBIs in the context of startups or incubation for SMEs. Incubation for SMEs is a rare phenomenon in India. I mean, it is there in some institutions. For example, there's a VIT, we are not, we're not, it's a VIT, I mean, uh, VIT Institute of Technology, something in Chennai. They promote SMEs. There are some incubators which promote SMEs. There is a women in incubator in Chennai. They promote women ent entrepreneurship, including small scale. There is an incubator in Hyderabad. They promote women entrepreneurship on a large scale. I do not get, I do not remember the name correctly, but they have generated women-led enterprises in a large number, in hundreds, multiples of hundreds, that, that stands apart in the country, I would say. Sorry. So there are incubators which promote women entrepreneurship. Right. And even Niti Aayog has their women power with the, uh, with the UN women and there right. are several others. Right. right. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, sir. So, uh, Professor Dev, uh, can we begin with the final round of reflections from the discussants uh, quick and then we'll have your views followed by Professor Balas. Yeah, please go ahead. I suppose you take Ketan first and then Radhika. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Ketan, over to you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, Professor Bala, for responding to the queries and enriching the discussion ahead. Uh, I, I, I really like the fact that you have done so much of survey and from the findings you highlight how industry academia linkage is extremely important. So rather than just coming up with policies, that is a more appropriate way ahead. Uh, the notions which were uh, echoed by Dr. Aklesh as well. So that this discussion does seem to give us a clear direction as to what should be the way ahead rather than just coming out with policies and a better implementation of the existing ones and trying to get the most out of them. And in the academia has an important role to play. You also highlighted how a lot of incubators uh, are not well, uh, are not filled. And also there is clearly potential and avenues already existing. So that is something we need to take upon. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. It was a very enriching and enlightening uh, discussion. And uh, it was nice to hear to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ketan. Uh, Dr. Radhika, over to you. Yes, so uh, thank you for the enriching discussion. Again, the key point emanating from the discussion is that, you know, there's a scope for greater collaboration between MSMEs and academia. And at the same time, there is scope for, you know, review of whatever, you know, not asking for more number of schemes, but whatever schemes are presently there uh, for the benefit of SMEs. Uh, there is a need for critical appraisal of those schemes so that they can be made more beneficial. A key point also emerging from this entire discussion is that you know, presently we have focused the discussion on uh, small and medium enterprises, but given that the universe of MSMEs overwhelmingly consists of micro enterprises, there's also need for thinking of what needs to be done to incentivize micro enterprises to scale up so that they become small and medium. And this is particularly relevant uh, in the given uh, present scenario where the definition of micro, small and medium enterprises has changed. Uh, so the entire universe of 
micro, small and medium enterprises has undergone a change. Uh, so there is a need to think about what needs to be done so that you know there is a greater, uh, there is a change in the composition of the MSME universe as such. And we, we do not have just overwhelmingly large 99% uh, of MSMEs uh, being constituted by micro enterprises. There's need to incentivize for the to their, uh, so that they grow into small and medium. Uh, and one, uh, a critical thing that needs to be done is that, that you know there are a large number of compliance requirements uh, which incentive which disincentivizes these enterprises to grow big to scale up uh, so that needs to be done so because ultimately what we uh, all strike for is more employment generation more economic growth more export more right. investment so for that what is important for the country as a whole is that these micro enterprises grow up uh, and uh, a critical determinant of that as uh, dr akilesh pointed out is uh, regarding the uh, registration uh, now we have uh, earlier we used to have the udyog aadhar memorandum now we have the uh, udyam uh, uh, registration system which has become more uh, voluntary uh, msme ministry is doing a lot to ensure that there is a greater awareness so that more and more MSMEs become part of the formal uh, system and they register there uh, so that they can take advantage of all the schemes, including the credit and including the priority sector lending of uh, RBI. But what needs to be done is more awareness at the local level, at the state level, because what our survey tells us is that Still, in a lot of states, there is there is lack of awareness about this registration uh, system. So, all in all, uh, while SMEs play an important role, it is important that you know there's greater collaboration, and at the same time, there's greater emphasis on uh, policies, on scheme, uh, on the, uh, the incentive structure to ensure that the micro enterprises scale up, and we have more proportion of enterprises in the small bracket and in the medium bracket. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. Uh, Dr. Arjun, uh, if you can hear me, can you? Hear yes, me? yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes please, just, Arjun, go to ahead. To sum up, I just wanted to ask one question to our chair and uh, also Bala sir, that our prime minister also, and due to this pandemic, we have this Atmirbhar Bharat push. And uh, the Make in India push has also been uh, reinvigorated. And uh, uh, Prime Minister time and again is also saying that uh, each of the district has to export and we have to specialize uh, and uh, in UP and several other states, there is one district, one product. There is a lot of export push really to integrate with the global value chain. And uh, there is so much of monetary push, I would say, for credit and others. Uh, small uh, enterprises are being out of it because of compliance and other. Uh, for compliance also, 5,000, 6,000 rules are also being uh, rationalized. So uh, I just wanted to ask that what can be really the way forward to go through how our leadership is looking uh, to, uh, uh, you know, also looking at China and the success of East Asian economies. What should we do? And also what should we not do uh, going forward for uh, uh, making an India push and uh, harnessing our SME potential? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Arjun. Uh, Dr. Akhilesh, if you could quickly come in. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um... <clears throat> uh, uh, one point I would like to add, I agree with the uh, summarization by uh, Dr. Ketan and Dr. Radhika. We have an institution at the district level that is the district industrial center. And this center can play a very key role in uh, improving the registration process, giving the training to the uh, small and medium enterprises, because it is the institution that play key role in the primary priority sector lending also. And uh, all the government schemes applications are rooted through uh, district industrial center. Uh, so in my view, if uh, we can uh, focus on improving the performance of district industrial center and through which we can try to give the entrepreneurial training and the training of the um, uh, financial, uh, financial literacy to the entrepreneurs. And we can in increase the registration process because after that, we can easily uh, give them the information about the different processes, whether uh, being the part of the GBC or whether uh, 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 giving them the information about the, some uh, fest or host in some other, some other countries. Uh, so this are uh, um, 
uh, linking them with the other uh, incubation centers, accelerators, etc. Uh, so, in my view, there is a need to focus on the increasing the performance of DIC and the, in the institutional setups what we have and increase the uh, formalization of the industry. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Akhilesh. Uh, can we have uh, Professor Bala, if you could respond? Yeah, I, I strongly believe that there is an urgent need to strengthen and promote the SME sector for the sake of our own country's economic growth. And the best way forward is to, as I said, promote industry institute interaction, promote their innovation, promote their internationalization. I would like to sum it up that way. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Professor, Professor Devnathan, over to you for your closing remarks and if you could address the question posed by Arjun. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> well, it's been a very interesting uh, webinar. Thanks to Professor Bala Subramaniam for a very uh, important contribution to the discussion. The question of why we need to have regional innovation systems or centers so as to be able to promote the innovation activities of, of SMEs. So this is important because it's important to be able to move not just into but even to go up value chains. But in concluding this discussion, I'll just make a couple of points which like Arjun raised the so what do we do to be able to increase India's participation in these things? First in the value chains, first is don't have an inverted tariff structure. This has been the problem that India has had for a long time. We did not have the inverted tariff structure in automobiles, which is why did we, we have done well in automobiles. What is the meaning of an inverted tariff structure? When the tariff on the intermediates is higher than the tariff on the final product. We have had, we, we did not have that for automobiles, as I said, the, in, the tariff on a, imported, a fully imported vehicle is very much higher than the tariff on parts or components. Therefore, you begin by promoting the import of components to assemble and then step-by-step, step, you can have a process of localization. That is the first point. Secondly, Arjun referred to this push for having some kind of uh, exports by various districts. I will say a little bit about the origin of this policy. This really comes from Thailand. Thailand, after the crisis of the, the late 90s and, 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 the, and, and the mid to 2000s, had a policy, what they call one tambon, one, one product. A tambon is like our district. So each, pro each district was asked to promote one product from that district, which would then be supported exactly as Dr. Bala was saying, through some kind of innovation system. So you have a design center, you have a quality control center, you have marketing support, <coughs> and you have all of these scale sensitive functions being carried out by supportive institutions. I have seen slowly these products now have become export products and I see them being sold <coughs> even on Thai Airways flights. So the point is you can move. You need, as Dr. Bala is pointing out, you do require a support for an innovation system. You require to support local products with an innovation system, but you also need to put before them the necessity of growing and not just remaining at the small scale at which they are happy right now. So you, know, you need to make them uncomfortable with remaining small. This also requires a reduction of compliance burden. All small units complain. I complain. I mean, I'm a, uh, I work as a consultant. I don't get a salary. But now I've been given a notice by the GST that we are canceling your GST registration. Why? They say you're not functioning from the registered address, which is quite incorrect. I function from the address, which is my home. And that's where I function from. Now I have to make a visit to the GST office and again go show them these same papers that they've had before. So they just increase compliance requirements because the bureaucracy has become so powerful. They can just cancel it and then what do you do? You're stuck. Now you go back and try to get it done again. Small producers all over the country keep complaining. Look, we, we don't get our GST refund that we are due. The big companies get it, the small ones don't. So the problem is that the bureaucracy is getting 
uh, enormously powerful, and that is not good for developing the economy. Secondly, it is not good, as I pointed out, it is not good to have a tariff structure which will make it more and more difficult to import the components you require for exporting. That is exactly the point of global value chains. In order to export, you have to import. If you stop imports, like for instance, even it's very difficult to import the high quality synthetic fabrics because we have a monopoly in this country. So therefore India has a very small position, a very low position in the export of synthetic fabric garments. We have a strong position in the export of cotton based garments, but not for synthetics. So if you don't remove these, import restrictions in one way or the other on the import of components, it will be very difficult to grow the, 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 the scope of export through global value chains. So thank you. Thanks to IMPRI and to Simi and Arjun for having organized this webinar. Thank you so much, sir, for wonderfully summing it up. And actually, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar is in Ranchi and uh, uh, is therefore unable to come on video because of being outside. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure having uh, this discussion. And uh, although we have exceeded by 21 minutes, but I am sure it was totally worth it and very, very enriching discussion. Thank you again. And I would, with this, I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks uh, on behalf of the Center for Work and Welfare at Impact and Policy Research Institute. Counterview and Working People's Charter, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to our speaker, Professor M. H. Bala Subramanya, our chair, Professor Dev Nathan, our discussants for the day, uh, Dr. Radhika Pandey, Ketan, and uh, Dr. Akhilesh, thank you for joining in, and uh, Dr. Arjun for uh, leading us into this uh, wonderful session and uh, team impri. Thank you again, and I hope that we'll be able to indulge in such discussions again and again, so that uh, this important theme is covered in the policy perspectives as well as uh, you know, in the way forward. Thank you so much. And I wish you all a very good evening and good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you so much. Have a nice evening. Thank you.